message is, take your seat. Amen. God's got a seat for you and he wants you to take it. Amen. Now, I like comfortable chairs. And one good thing about the age we live in is they make more comfortable chairs than they used to. Remember when chairs were, you know, just pretty small? But now they make big and tall chairs. And I've got some really comfortable chairs at home. But some of the most comfortable chairs I've ever sat in are in our church foyer. I'm not talking about the ones at the table, but those four padded chairs are awesome. If you've never sat in one, you need to check it out. I love those chairs. And you may say, well, what does chairs have to do with Jesus? Well, Jesus came to earth and he showed us what God was like. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he sat down. And that's where he is now at the right hand of the Father. He took his seat. And the Bible says we take our seat in him. Ephesians 2 and verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only did Jesus take his seat in heaven, but the Bible says we are seated with him. Amen. We're seated in heaven too because Jesus is seated in heaven. And so we begin the Christian life with what God has already done for us. Most religions in the world, people attain, they do works to get people, uh, to get God to love them. And so they're trying to work their way to heaven, trying to work for their salvation. But in Christianity, it begins with something God has already done for you in Christ. Yes. Amen. And so God is given to you. Jesus worked for you. Amen? And, uh, and so he did it. And when you sit down, take all the weight off of your feet. When you finish your work at the end of the day, you sit down. Unless you work at a desk like me. But, uh, but you sit down and you rest. And so we rest in what Christ has done for us. He finished his work. I heard a preacher say one time, God has done everything for you he's already going to do. Did you know that? And sometimes people don't understand that. But God in Christ has already done everything for you that he's going to do. The work is already done. You just receive it by faith. And you have to understand it's established fact. And with faith, you reach out and you grab what God has already given you. You grab what Christ earned for us in his finished work on Calvary. And so Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. He's our great high priest. The Bible says he's praying for us. And if you don't have anybody else praying for you, Jesus is praying for you. Did you ever say, well, I don't have a prayer partner. Let me tell you, you've got the best prayer partner there is. You've got two prayer partners. You have Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in heaven praying for you. The Holy Spirit's on the inside. He joins together with us to pray according to the will of God. And if you need a prayer partner, praise God, the Holy Spirit's a great prayer partner. But Jesus is directing the body of Christ. A lot of people don't think about what Jesus is doing now. They think about what he did and then what he's going to do whenever he comes back again. But they don't think about what he's doing now. But Jesus is active in ministry. He's head of the body of Christ. And, and so when God created the world's he worked for six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. And so he created Adam on the sixth day. And when Adam came to earth, all the work was already finished. And Adam's first day on earth was God's day of rest. And so when Christ completed his work, he sat down. And so we enjoy his finished work of faith. And between God's rest and creation... And God's rest and in Christ's rest and redemption, you have the story of man and the story of his fall and his failure. And so man was in perfect relationship with God. They walked and talked with God in the Garden of Eden. As a matter of fact, God created, created uh, people because he wanted children. He wanted fellowship. He wanted relationship. But man's sin broke that. And the Holy God can't fellowship with sin. And so Jesus had to come to earth and pay the price. He had to come to earth and become a man and be our representative to pay the price for us. But the Bible says when we were dead in sins, God quickened us together with Christ. Amen? 
Even when you couldn't help yourself, God reached down and helped you. And he quickened you together with Christ and seated, uh, seated you with him in heavenly places yeah. in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And so what happened to Jesus happened to you. The Bible says everything that happened to Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection has happened to us too because we were in him. And so you may think, well, how could, how could I be in him because all that happened 2,000 years ago? And the reason is because what your ancestors did had an effect upon you. The choices that they made helped shape who you are today and what you're doing today. And my grandfather uh, turned his life over to God when he was about 30 years old. And uh, he had a good job, but he drank a lot. And so the story is, uh, my, uh, my aunt was sick, and so uh, they took her to the doctor. She couldn't get well. They took her to church, and she got healed. And so after she got healed, they got saved, started living for God, and he started going to church. And, and uh, after a few years, he accepted a call to preach and, and became a pastor. And so that decision had an effect upon me. And then my father, he was raised in church. When he became an adult, he was called to preach and became a pastor. And so their decisions affected me because I was in him. I was in them. Even though I wasn't born yet, I was still in them. Amen? What they did had an effect upon me. And so when Adam and Eve sinned and broke fellowship with God, they lost their relationship with God. But God had a plan of redemption to get man back and bring us back into fellowship. And so the plan of redemption was for Jesus to become a man and be the representative for the entire human race. And so Romans 5, 19 says, For by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he did it for us. When he was punished for sin, he was punished for our sins. Jesus lived a sinless life. He didn't need to pay the price for his sins, but he paid the price for our sin and was punished for our sin. And he was punished as our representative so that we wouldn't have to be punished for our sins if we accept the gift of Jesus Christ and accept that through faith. And uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And the word workmanship just means a product or something that's made. And so it could be a painting, it could be a work of art, it could be a piece of furniture, it could be an automobile, but it's a something that was produced for a purpose. And so we are God's workmanship. God created us for a purpose. And, and so the Bible says it was before ordained. In other words, before Christ ever came to the earth, God planned for us to be made into the image of Christ. And so Christianity is about God remaking the human race in Jesus Christ. Come on, Adam was the first representative of the human race. He came and fell. He couldn't live for God. He couldn't obey God. He sinned. He fell. He lost relationship with God. But the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. Come on, the second Adam came. He lived a sinless life. He did not fail. He was faithful to his task and his mission. And so he was our representative. And so we were in him. God saw us before we were ever born. He saw us in Christ and he created us to be in Christ. Amen? So you don't see yourself just as your natural self and whatever family that you were born into, but you're born into Christ, into his family. And when you get born again, you get a new family. People say, well, I was born like this. You ever hear anybody say that? I drink because I was born like this. My daddy drank, my grandpa drank, my great-grandpa drank, and, and you know, or, or I fight, or I'm mean because I was born like this. And, and the Bible says, that's why you must be born again. Amen? Yeah. You get born again, and you get in Christ. Yeah. Come on, you, were, you had a natural birth, but you've got to have a second birth, which is being born again, born into Christ. And whatever you were before Christ, you're not any longer. And the problem is you've got to know about it and you've got to notify your head. Amen? And the Bible says you've got to renew your mind. You've got to change your thinking as to who you are in Christ because you've got a brand new identity. The Bible says if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Amen? 
a brand new species of being. You're not what you look like, but you're in Christ. Amen? And so your choice is determined if you follow that plan. But when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you step into Him and everything that He is because He was your representative. Amen. And so you step out of who you used to be and you step into Christ. Before I got born again, I didn't want to go to church. I went to church because my wife made me and to keep peace in the family. And after church, I'd be drinking, you know, and watching football and, and whatever on, in the fall. Uh, now you can watch it year-round, I guess, but in the fall, I'd be watching football. But, but uh, I went to church because I pretty much had to. I didn't want to be there. But, you know, something changed. One day during worship, the Holy Spirit moved up upon me and something got a hold of me. The Spirit of God got a hold of me and began to move in my heart and move in my life. And caused me to see my need of Christ. And caused me to see my need of change. Nobody forced me to accept Jesus. I accepted, I turned my life over to Jesus because I wanted to. And I didn't like the life I was living. Even though I was doing things that they should have been a lot of fun. And uh, I mean there is some pleasure in sin. But I was also miserable at the same time. Amen. I saw my need of Jesus. Saw my need of change. And I turned my life over to him. Well, everything didn't change all at once. Amen. I had to begin to renew my mind. and God had to begin to work in me and begin to change me. And then uh, gave me a call to preach. And, I, you know, when the call to preach comes, I said, man, I can't do that. You know, I don't see how I could ever do that. I didn't like public speaking and, and being up in front of people and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it took a lot of faith to be able to accept that call and begin to move forward. But took one step at a time. But everything changes in Christ. Amen? And the last thing I ever wanted to be was a preacher because my dad was a preacher. And I didn't want to be a preacher because I knew what the life was like. You're in church a whole lot. You sit around and visit and talk with people a whole lot. And, and, uh, and so I didn't really want to, I didn't want that life because I knew, knew what it was like. But but uh, God changed my heart, changed my desires. And so I didn't realize that I was running from the thing that was probably the best thing for me. Right. Amen. So now, you know, just eating fried chicken just about every day. Um, so and I love fried chicken. I don't know why, but man, that's about my favorite food. But, uh, but preachers and fried chicken kind of go together. Amen. But... You stepped out of who you used to be and you stepped into Christ. Amen. Everybody's looking at who they used to be and they don't look at who they are in Christ and who God says they are. And it's shocking to see your new identity. Amen. I don't care what condition you're in today, but in Christ you're a new person and you're changed. You have to believe it by faith and then it becomes a reality in your life. You see, when you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, your mind doesn't change, your body doesn't change. Come on, but change, something changes on the inside. And when you confess with your mouth, like I was teaching last week, then faith is released and something happens and Christ moves in on the inside. And then He begins to take control. He begins to change things. And the beautiful thing is, He changes your desire. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody asked me... Uh, a few years ago, you know, you ever tempted to drink? I said, no, but I should do like ice cream. Uh, no, I, I said, I, I'd rather have a, a dessert or food than, than alcohol, actually. You know, God changed my desires. Amen? I don't want to fight. I, I will if I'm forced to. I don't want to fight and fuss with people. Amen? God changes your desire. He changes your heart. I used to have a goal of Wanted to be rich, but I gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> Amen. But you know, every house that I've lived in since I went into ministry is better than the house I lived in before I went into ministry. So let me just say that. Amen. Amen. And so there, there were some upgrades. I don't have a goal of being rich, but I, I know I'm going to be eternally, eternally rich. Yeah. I'll take rich. There's nothing wrong with that. But... But praise God, God changes your desire. But that's, that's not my heart. That's, my, that's not my goal anymore. And so when you get seated with Christ, you see things from a heavenly perspective. Amen? You see things from a different perspective. 
And so this summer, our family went to visit uh, Yosemite National Park in California. And so my daughter, Annie and Tim, they went there about four years ago and visited. Uh, visited and, and of course, they like to hike. And so we were going to go, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to do any hiking unless it's, it's hiking to the cafe or something like that. And I said, I'll ride around in the car and look at it. But, you know, a lot of those hikes, you, you walk up hills, elevation, and, and uh, it's already at a high elevation. So anyway, they like to do that, but, but I rode around in the car. But the thing you have to know about Yosemite National Park, if you go, is it's in the middle of nowhere. And I mean nowhere. It's not close to any big city. And uh, it's remote, and so the closest towns are small towns, and it's about an hour drive to get into Yosemite National Park. And there's a, a little bit of lodging there, but not a whole lot, and it's all booked up. So you have to stay an hour away, and you have to drive in and out down this little two-lane road that, on the side of a river. And, uh, and it's beautiful, desert mountains and things that you drive through. But when you get in there, you, you drive straight into Yosemite Valley. And so you were in desert mountains, but then you get into a lush paradise, and there's a beautiful river flowing down the middle of the valley, and there's trees, and there's forests, and, and there's lakes, and there's wildlife, and it's beautiful. But the, the, unique, the unique thing about Yosemite is that the valley is surrounded by bare granite peaks and rocks and walls, and, and so it was shaped by glaciers however many years ago, depending on how you believe in your in your theory of creation, but it was shaped by glaciers, and so they're just bare rocks with no trees on them, but they're, they're mountains, they're high. And so when you when you look up, when, you, when you're in Yosemite Valley, you look up at the peaks, and they dwarf you. Yeah. And one of them is called El Capitan. Probably a lot of you heard of that, but El Capitan is a 3,000 foot tall square block of granite. And so the front of it, and it's, it's kind of square, but it was carved by glaciers, and the front wall is 3,000 foot tall, and so it's one of the most famous climbing walls in the world. It's also the most dangerous climb in the world. And so you look up at it, it looks, it looks huge. There you go. And, uh, and so people have climbed it with ropes. There's only one guy who climbed it without ropes. It's a guy named Alex Homo. And so to climb it without ropes simply means that if you slip, you're dead. And so he climbed it in a little less than four hours and climbed straight up and it was filmed in a movie called Free Solo. And it's just a, it's an incredible movie and you, it makes you want, it helps you understand climbing and why you wouldn't want to do it. And it makes, it makes, you, it makes you wonder why anyone would want to do it. But that's his thing. He grew up wanting to be a climber just like other people grow up wanting to be a baseball player or football player. Something like that. He grew up wanting to be a climber, and that's what he pursued. It's just an amazing story, and, and uh, how incredibly fit you had to be to climb a wall for four hours, and you're breathing hard the whole time, and, and so it's amazing. But there's another peak which is called Half Dome, and Half Dome is 8,800 foot tall. It's really a mountain, and at the top of the top 2,000 foot is a Half Dome. That's why they call it Half Dome. It's it was shaped by glaciers, and so the front side is flat, and it's also a famous climbing wall. And so a lot of people have climbed it with ropes. I think Alex is the only one who climbed it without ropes and free soloed it. And so it's amazing. But when you're in the valley, you look up at these peaks, and, and they look huge, and they just dwarf you. Yeah. But you know, we took a drive, and we drove up the mountain on the other side, and we went to this place called Glacier Point. And so Glacier Point is just the, the lookout on the side of a mountain where you look over the valley and you can see the valley and you can see about half of Yosemite National Park, which is about 600 square miles. And so you can see half of it, you can see half of the mountains and, and just a beautiful view, one of the most beautiful views in the world. But you look down on Yosemite Valley with the same peaks that you look up, up at, you look down on. And so you're about the same level uh, with Half Dome, you're way above El Capitan, and they look small. Because uh, when your elevation changes, your perspective changes. In Christ, you're seated in heavenly places, yeah. your perspective changes, and your view changes. The things, problems that look big on the earth, look small from heaven. Amen? Things that you thought were mountains look like mobiles when you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. 
And so we're seated in a place of triumph. We're seated in a place of victory. Amen. Far above all, principality and power and might and dominion. And the problem is most Christians don't know about it and they don't see things from that view and from that perspective. Amen. But we are seated with Christ in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And there's a beautiful story in the Bible, which is the story of a man's redemption. It's a story of, of David and Mephibosheth, but it's really a story of God and man. And it's a perfect story of God's redemption. And sometimes I hesitate to even teach this story because it's so moving. And sometimes I'll read it in a week uh, because it's so powerful and there's, there's something really strong and powerful in this story. But I'm going to try to tell it and I always pray God let me tell it with a straight face and not cry. But, but it's a story of how uh, King Saul and King David, uh, not King Saul, King, how Jonathan and David were best friends. And so uh, Jonathan was King Saul's son. And so they were best friends. You know the story. King Saul was always trying to kill David. And so Jonathan would warn him and help him. And so they were in covenant together. And they were best friends. And then in later years, King Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle. And when that happened, Jonathan's family fled. And when they did, they fled in fear and they dropped his youngest son who was named Mephibosheth, uh, and he was crippled for life. And, uh, and so when David became king, he remembered his friend Jonathan. He said, I want to help his family. I want to help his son. And, and so it's found in 2 Samuel 9, in verse 3. The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Zion said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Zion said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And I will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Yeah. And he bowed himself, and he said, What is thy servant? Thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. So David is king, and he wants to give. He wants to bless. He knows you can't outgive God. And David was a big person, because anybody from King, Saul, how king Saul's house would be his enemy. Would be somebody that normally you would kill not somebody that you would help. And, and so David wanted to help Mephibosheth. He, he remembered his friend and he wanted to help his son. And so when he finds out about Mephibosheth, he says, go fetch him. And I guess David was from the south because he used words like fetch. He had friends named Jethro. So uh, David said, go fetch him. And so Ziba brings in a, a broken man who's torn and shattered. He's in fear. He's just a, a bag of bones on the floor. And so Mephibosheth should have been king, but he got dropped. Yeah. It was through no fault of, own, of his own that he was dropped. And, and the name Mephibosheth means shame. That's a terrible name. How would you like to inter introduce yourself as shame? But he had shame not because of any mistake that he'd made, but because of mistakes of other people that had affected him. He didn't do anything wrong. Somebody else made a mistake that hurt him and that damaged him. You know, the same thing can be true in people's lives. Come on, some people have been dropped. If you've lived long enough, at one point in your life, you've been dropped. Somebody has done things that hurt you and that wounded you and had an effect upon you. And for some people, then they're emotionally crippled for the rest of their life because of what happened to them. And so Mephibosheth is living in a place called Lodabar, a place in the wilderness. And the word Lodabar means no communication. It means that it is that you are cut off. Mephibosheth is living in the wrong place. And, and uh, David went and he fetched him. And it's nice to know when you can't get to God, God can get to you. Yeah. When, you're when you can't help yourself,
God can help you. Yeah. You see, you can't get out of Lodomar by yourself. And that a man's natural ability and self-discipline. You can't get out of Lodomar. But God, who's rich in mercy, even when we were dead in sins, quickened us together with Christ and reached down and pulled us out. Amen. Some of us wouldn't be here if God hadn't reached down and pulled us out of the place and the mess that we were in. Some of your testimonies to the grace of God. And if God hadn't changed your life, you wouldn't be here today. You'd be dead. You'd be in prison. Bad things would have happened to you. But because of the grace of God, maybe you had a praying, you had praying parents or grandparents who prayed for you. But because of the grace of God, God reached down and pulled you out in His mercy because He loved you. Amen. When you had no communication with God, God pulled you out. And He loved you that much because He saw value in you. Come on, when other people couldn't see value, He saw value in you. When you couldn't see value in yourself, God saw something in you and saw something that you could be. Amen. And so they bring Mephibosheth in. He's laying on the floor. He's trembling. He's broken. He said, I'm just a dog. And so Mephibosheth is broken, but he's got the DNA of a king on the inside of him. Come on, he has an identity. That's it. He's got royal blood in his veins, even though he doesn't look like it. And you may not look like you're a child of the king, but you're the child of the king. Because it's not based upon your outward appearance. It's not based upon your status, but it's based upon who you are in Christ. Amen. And so Mephibosheth has no hope for the future. But David said, I got a place at the table for you. Come on, David said, you're going to eat at the table with the rest of the family. You're going to eat at the table with the rest of my sons. And David's other sons, they were strong, they were fit, they worked hard. But when Mephibosheth was at the table, you couldn't tell the difference between him and the other sons. Amen. Because his weakness was hidden when he was at the table. Yeah. You see, when you're seated with Christ, come on, nobody can tell the difference between you and Jesus. Amen. Because you're seated together. And what people can't see on the outside, God sees on the inside. And your weaknesses are hidden in Christ. In Christ, you're more than you could ever be on your own. You can do more than you could ever do in the natural or on your own because it's who you are in Christ and what he has done. And so, Mephibosheth has been living like a pauper. Now, he's going to eat the best. Amen? I like to eat the best. I've told people, I may never have a Rolls Royce. I may never live in a, a multi-million dollar mansion, but I can eat the best. And let me tell you, I've eaten some of the best. Praise God. I like that. And so, David said, you're going to eat the best. You're going to eat at the king's table. Mephibosheth was crippled. David gave him a, a crew to work for him. And they were going to work his land, restore the, restore the lands he should have had. They are going to work his land for him. All he has to do is sit there and relax and eat at the table. That's a picture of us in Christ. Yeah. Come on, we didn't deserve our position in Christ, but we have it. Amen? Yeah. And it's not because of who we are. It's because of the family that we are born in. Yeah. And so Mephibosheth has favor because of his father, Jonathan. It's nothing that he did, but he's, he was in Jonathan before he was ever born. Yeah. And the actions of Jonathan had an effect upon him because his father had a covenant with a king. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You may not have a father who had a covenant with a king, but you got an older brother who had a covenant with a king. And what he did gave the favor of God in your life. Yeah. It brought the favor of God upon your life. It's not something that you did, but it's somebody who loved you. You were in them before you were ever born. Amen. Yeah. You were in him and the things that Jesus Christ did had an effect upon you. Yeah. Praise God. God has, the Bible says he's prepared a table for us in the midst of our enemies. Amen. And when your enemies are looking on, they can see you eating well and you being blessed. You know, the best revenge is success and blessing. Amen. And nowadays with Facebook, you can just let them see all the blessings you enjoy. Amen. Without them. Amen. They thought, they thought you needed them. Surprise, surprise. 
You're a son of the king. Amen? You're a son of the king. And you eat the best. And you live the best. Because you're connected to Jesus Christ. And what he has done for you. We did nothing to earn the mercy of God. But God who is rich in favor. Even when we were dead in sins. Made us alive in Christ. And caused us to be seated with Christ. In heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Yeah. And some of you are here today thinking, if I could just work harder, if I could just do more, if I could just give more, if I could just serve more, if I could just pray more, then I'd be seated with Christ in heavenly places. No, the day you got born again, you were seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might. And you know what the devil wants to do is keep Christians in the dark. If he can keep you from seeing this revelation, and knowing this revelation, he can keep you down. And he can keep you living like a Christian worm the rest of your life. Trying to attain and trying to be something and hoping that someday that you'll be where you need to be. But it was given to you as a gift. Jesus Christ paid the price and he handed it to you. The Bible says we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Jesus was a conqueror. He handed it. He gave it to us. That makes us more than a conqueror. Amen? So stop trying to earn something that you already have. It's already given to you in Christ. And when you know this, you see things from a different perspective. Because you have authority in Christ. You have standing in Christ. Not in yourself, but who you are in Him. Amen? We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, with a good purpose. God had a purpose and a plan for you before you were ever born. Amen. Amen. And when you accept Christ, you find out about that plan. And you continue to do what he's called you to do. Now, I just want to give an invitation today. Some of you are you're cut off and you're a place of no communication with God. But everybody else may have forgotten about you. But God had forgotten about you. He knows where you are. And he cares. Not only does he care, he's reaching out to you today. It's not an accident that you're here today or you're, or you're watching via video. It's not an accident. This message is for you. Come on, you've been separated from God. You've been cut off from God in that relationship and fellowship. But God is saying, i got a purpose for you. i got a plan for you. You may have made mistakes, but he's calling you back home today. And so I just I want to pray a prayer for anybody who's here. If you stand to your feet today, I want to pray a prayer for anybody who may be here or you're watching, and you just need to rededicate your life to Jesus. Maybe you've done things that have broken fellowship with Him, but He's calling you back saying, I love you, I forgive you. Come back to restore relationship and fellowship. So let's just pray this together and say, Dear Jesus, forgive me for walking away from you. Forgive me for my sins. I thank you for what you've done for me in Christ. I thank you that you made me a new person. And I'm coming home to take my seat. Seated with you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you're, you're restored to fellowship today. Amen. You just got to find out who you are in Christ and live like you were created to be. I want to give another altar call this morning. If you have needs this morning, some of you are living below your privileges in Christ. Amen. Things have come to your life and, and you thought, you know, man, just God help me. And you prayed about those things, but the Bible says they're already yours. You claim them by faith. So whatever your need is today, if you need healing, if you need finances, if you need help in some way, I'm going to invite you to come forward. I'll pray with you and lay hands upon you. But I know that God will touch your heart. Amen. And meet your need this morning. So we'll wait just a minute and give you an opportunity to come. Uh, Pastor Candy can come and help me too and, and we'll be glad to pray with you today but don't live below your place in Christ in Christ there's healing in Christ there's restoration in Christ there's financial supply and provision in Christ there's peace of mind in Christ there's restored families in Christ there's hope and God has hope for you today in Christ let's just sing and worship as we're praying for the others today let's close in prayer Father we thank you what Jesus Christ has done for us. Thank you for giving that revelation to us that we'll live and walk in it and live in the victory that you have for us 
And Father, we just thank you for opening the eyes of everybody in this congregation that we'll see ourselves as being seated with Christ. Heavenly places. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. I'd like to thank Mark Cole for helping us with worship today. Christian's friend. God bless you.